Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Avatar, the podcast. Comic edition. Comic edition. I'm Booster Greg. That's Acorn Bandit. Hello. Hello. And we are down to the final episodes of the comic coverage involving Team Avatar. <laughs> I can't believe it. I can't even. I was just thinking about this the other day. We have probably what? Four episodes. We have three comics plus the recap. Uh huh. At least four episodes. And then we're done for now with the yep. original Team Avatar. Oh man, when you put it like that. Yeah, I know. It is a reminder, we got so much extra story following our original Team Avatar friends, but you're right, it's all about to come to an end. Yep, up until, I mean, if they put out some new stuff, which it sounds like they are, so we'll yep. get a nice little revisit later down the line, but as far as the original content goes, this is it. This is it. So everyone soak it in, get ready. I have a feeling after reading this issue that mm -hmm. the next two are probably just going to be bridging the gap between the spirit world and the physical world. No, I'm just kidding. Between <laughs> Avatar The Last Airbender and Korra is what yep. I'm feeling. But I could be wrong. Who knows? We'll find out in the coming weeks. Yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And for all of you Korra fans out there who have been writing in and commenting that you can't wait for us to get to Korra, it's coming. It's coming. We're that much closer now. We're getting so close. It's going to be amazing. But as we always do at the beginning of each and every episode, we got some five-star reviews to cover from Apple Podcasts. Yes, we do. Yes, yes, yes. Our very first review comes from our close personal friend of the podcast, 5436745, who writes, amazing. I love your show. I'm always waiting for more fun content from Caroline. Caroline. Or as we Thank like you, to Caroline. call her. Five, four, three, six, seven, four, five. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. We super appreciate that. We're glad you're enjoying the show and we're super thankful that you left the review. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next review comes from Piggity and they write, awesome. You guys do an awesome job on this podcast. I have never left a review and have no clue what else to say. So I'm going to end this <laughs> awkwardly. Oh, <laughs> By the way, that's the best way to end anything is awkwardly, in my opinion. Yes, I agree. That was great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it looks like they actually left a review earlier, but there's an update and the update is a top five and a favorite quote. So I thought it pertinent nice. to include it. Yes, pertinent. That's a big word for me, by the way. You should all be proud. I expect a pat on the back. Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, their top five is Iroh at number one. Number two, Zuko. Three, Sokka. Four, Suki. We don't get a lot of top five Sukis, I've noticed. We don't. I appreciate that. I do too. And Azula, because in nice, parentheses, nice. she's a great character. Was that a pointed remark towards you, Greg? Probably, yeah. I, I will. <laughs> let, me, let me say this. I sent it to Acorn as soon as it happened. I commented on one of Gray Griffin's tweets, and she liked it. So <gasps> if anyone wants to congratulate me on that as well, I would appreciate it. It's a big moment in my life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The voice acting queen has recognized you, Greg. The voice acting queen of my least favorite character in Avatar <laughs> The Last Year. Not my least favorite. That's going a bit too far, but still. Uh -huh. It was funny. It was a good time. Piggity goes on to write, favorite quote by far, you miscalculated. I love Zuko more than I fear you. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. It shows the simple love versus fear leadership, philosophical differences between Zuzu and Azula and Iroh and Ozai. Yes. Very cool. Very, very cool. Such a good one. Yes. So thank you for providing the quote and the top five. We super appreciate it. Yes. And the updated review as well. Thank you. Love when they come back and add to their thoughts. Yeah. Our next review comes from Boba T, Boba T Panda. Looks like that. those are yeah. the emojis. Yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. And this person says, hi. And it looks like a, a diamond. I think it's a I rock. I think it's supposed to be a rock. Or a rock. Yeah. That would make sense because we have a rock, mm -hmm. a water drop, mm -hmm. a storm cloud, and a fire emoji. Mm -hmm. They go on to write, the podcast is awesome. My top four are Azula, May, Suki, and Katara. Keep going. And we have more rocks and thunderstorms and water droplets and fire emojis. Mm -hmm. And then they say, sorry if the spelling is bad. It was perfect. Yeah. Thank you. It's great. Absolutely awesome. And that is the final review for this week. We still have a couple more to cover next. We can't cover them all in one week. We don't got the time for that. Time's a tick in here. The clock's <laughs> going. We got a whole episode to record. We have imbalance 
part one, or as we like to call it, the dawn of the equalist. That's right. Anyone who's watched Korra might notice some similar themes popping up in imbalance. Mm-hmm. And spoilers, it's not about how imbalanced Azula is, which is what I hypothesized a couple episodes back. <laughs> that would have been fun, though. Yes. This issue was written by Faith Erin Hicks, who everyone might remember her name as the woman who wrote the trilogy of, I would call it the empowered woman of Avatar, The Last Airbender. Mm -hmm. So we had our top story, we had Suki, and we also had, oh, what was the other one? I forget. Uh, Katara and the Pirate Suit. Katara, how, my Silver. favorite one. How can I forget? I know. I'm yes. disappointed in you, Craig. I know. Me too. I'm going to go cry afterwards and under my desk. It's fine. Get a good cry out of it. But this was also drawn by Peter Wartman with colors by Ryan Hill. We join Team Avatar as they fly to Yudao. Toph convinces Aang to stop at the Earthen Fire Industries so she can talk to her father, much to Sokka's disappointment, who cannot wait to see Suki again, and even suggests that Aang make a few upgrades to the Flying Bison. <laughs> He's like, can we like put some propulsion on Something. this? Something, we gotta get there um... faster in any way. And Aang was like, I don't think Appa would appreciate that. Yeah, Sokka's basically asking, like, you want to level up your Appa, yeah. your Air Bison model? <laughs> Which is super insensitive of Sokka because Appa is also Sokka's friend. Uh-huh, right? Mm -hmm, mm hmm I don't know. That felt like a weird writing choice. I'll let it slide. I'll let it slide. Faith Aaron Hicks, we'll let it slide. Toph claims that she needs to check on things and that she has a lot of responsibility as an executive partner of the company. She warns the rest of the group that Cranefish Town, which is what they are now calling the settlement that the Earth and Fire Industries was created and built in, has changed a lot since the group last saw it. And she wasn't kidding because that small factory town has now grown to the size of a large city. It is huge. It's taking up like, what is that, a quarter of the peninsula? Yeah. And this is something, this is pretty cool. This, as I said earlier, is a kind of a bridging the gap between Aang and Korra in terms of their worlds and how developed yeah. Korra got, right? And the societies within it. Technology and all of that. And this is giving us a taste for just how fast things move in this world post the 100 year war. Right? It's like as soon as actually didn't that happen in our history mm. post World War II things like production and industry just exploded. It's so weird that once you stop fighting each other, you just make so many technological advances. <laughs> Who knew? When you have some free time, <laughs> things you can achieve. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, yes. Yeah, so this, what, it was like a couple huts and, and the factory has now exploded into a full blown city. Yeah. We went from like a one road street with a couple shops, mm -hmm. including our friend, the cabbage merchants restaurant to, uh, this booming town. Didn't they suggest that the cabbage merchant move on to from that town? I think they did. They ruined him. <laughs> <laughs> He could have had so much business. Well, if I remember correctly, he will get more business and he'll still in spirit be a part of Korra. But uh -huh. I can just imagine him overlooking the city and just being like, those kids, they ruined my <laughs> life again. <laughs> Aang struggles to believe what he is seeing. And Katara asks if he is OK, knowing that the site used to be important to the Air Nomads. Aang isn't too sure what to feel and is in shock that the city grew practically overnight in his eyes. Sokka spots a place where Appa can land and becomes disappointed when the townspeople are completely indifferent to the group's arrival, even after Aang greets the townspeople and, at Sokka's urging, performs his airbending trick. <laughs> the one we all love from Kyoshi Island. He does the Kyoshi Island trick and everyone's just like, so what? And? Lao Beifong, who everyone remembers as Toph's father, welcomes the group and Toph goes to greet him. But Lao merely thanks her for bringing Aang to Cranefish Town. And in its hour of greatest need, Toph is a bit mm -hmm. confused that her father seems to be more excited to see Aang since she thought she was getting asked for her wonderful skills as an entrepreneur. Uh huh. Lao assures her that while he is always so happy to see Toph, the town needs the help of the Avatar desperately. He explains to Aang that as a result of Cranefish Town's expansion, there are now dozens of factories besides the earth and fire refinery. And this has presented a whole new set of challenges, not just for his business, mind you, but for life in the city and the town. Mm -hmm. Lao continues and tells Aang that since Cranefish Town currently has no official government, 
he and other business owners have formed a committee known as the Business Council. The Business Council is responsible for overseeing the city's growth. While Saka questions the choice of the name, Aang agrees to allow a suggestion to attend the council meeting being held that afternoon. You're right, Saka. That's a pretty boring name. <laughs> I just love how Saka is so like set on this name and how bad it is. And he's always like, eh, maybe I can think of a better name for them. I am the idea guy. After <laughs> I am all. the idea guy. That's right. Saka is not happy that he will have to wait even longer to see Suki now but forgets his woes almost immediately when he sees a rather unique Southern Water Tribe helmet being sold at a market stall. Even though the merchant either acquired, well, I'll say seemingly acquired the helmet through less than legal ways, Saka still wants to buy it, stating that he is the man born to wear this helmet. <laughs> I love that moment, too, because he's like, hey, Water Tribe stuff. And the guy's like, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then he holds it up and it's almost like he has this under light hitting yes. and it's this super dramatic moment. He's like, I am the man who was born to wear this helmet. So I have a question about this helmet for you. Yeah. Do you think that this is a legitimate Southern Water Tribe helmet that was stolen and this merchant is selling it? Or do you think it's counterfeit? Uh, I'm torn. I could see it you going do. either way. Yeah. My first thought when we got to this scene was that someone from the Southern Water Tribe needed some money mm -hmm. and sold the helmet with this really dramatic story. Like, oh yeah, it used to belong to a, a famous chieftain and this will get you lots of money. I also think it could have been stolen from someone mm -hmm. and they pass it off with this story. Or like you said, it could be a counterfeit. Maybe someone made one to look like yeah his actually well that's, it looks that's the pretty thing. counterfeit to me it does look counterfeit and i had that thought but it's also the art style yeah. and i can't tell yeah i think it would be funnier if it was counterfeit and then that this merchant is just building up the story and he has like 50 behind the curtain so as right. soon as that one goes out he plops another one out that would fit the vibe that we have yeah. going on in Cranefish Town. Yeah, it, it could go either way. We'll never know. Yeah. Ever. Because as soon as Sokka calls over to Aang, and by the way, Aang is like, yeah, you totally need to buy that, bud. Yeah. <laughs> the merchant sees a brawl about to break out between mm -hmm. a gang of earthbenders and a gang of firebenders. So he hurriedly closes up shop. Like, like a Western, a very Western vibe yes, of like very. shutting the shade, shutting the curtains, whatever, and being like, all right, bye, everyone go. No one's home. Yes. Aang attempts to negotiate a peaceful end to this fight between the benders, which doesn't exactly go as planned because Toph kind of steps in and forcibly separates the two sides with a newly bended earth wall. This only provides like a second of peace and then the two sides continue to fight. There's fire being thrown everywhere. There's earth being thrown everywhere. And eventually... One of the earthbenders gets knocked into one of the new buildings during this fight, damaging it to the point of collapse. Toph jumps into action and uses her bending to stop the building from collapsing and destroying someone's home. And she calls out to Aang for help, as in, help me with this building, please, Aang. Instead, Aang swoops in like Superman, <laughs> gets her out of the way, and the buildings nearby, including the one she was holding up, collapse into ruin yeah he's like i got you top and she's like not not what that I was saying, but okay thanks for saving my life i guess it's just really funny like i think this really goes to show ang still believes himself to be like the big hero of the story because uh -huh. if he stopped for a second to think about this you'd be like Toph has never once asked for help in a situation like this yeah <laughs> she's she's got it she's got it even if she doesn't got it she's gonna act like she's got it you have to like read her body language essentially mm-hmm so he's like, oh, finally, I get to save Toph. And Toph's like, no, you dunderhead. <laughs> yeah. So Toph clarifies that she wanted help, obviously holding up the building. But Aang replies that the building was already destroyed and whoever built it did a poor job in its construction. Mm. Aang and Toph return to Katara and Sokka to make sure that everyone is okay. They learn that both sets of benders escaped into the city while the siblings were helping everyone evacuate the collapsing buildings. Aang takes a moment to look over the devastation caused by the fight and wonders how many people lost their homes. It looks like an earthquake hit, like that yeah. level of devastation, like the aftermath is just, it's heartbreaking, actually, because you, you're watching people help themselves over mounds and out of piles, and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's very sad. It does. It looks like the aftermath of an earthquake. Yeah. Also, for anyone who hasn't read the comic, 
the streets look very much kind of like slums where things yeah. are stacked on top of each other. It's like boards and rock, like very low quality construction. It also kind of has that feeling of like Ready Player One in the stack. Kind of. Where yeah. It's just like a bunch of random construction, just whatever makes sense and people living on top of people. Picture, if you will, the outer rings of Ba Sing Se. There you go. But yep. worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Industry. Yeah. Style. Yeah. It's it's not great. Like the outer ring would be an upgrade. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's even like stacks in the middle of the town. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? Just did, like yeah. a whole bunch of random stacks. I don't know what they're there for. I don't know. But yeah, it's not looking pretty. Mm-mm. Lao humbly approaches Aang and states that fighting between benders has become a serious problem in the city and that he needs Aang's authority as the Avatar to deal with it. Aang's expression hardens as he thought Lao wanted his wisdom and guidance. And Lao tells the Avatar that he needs everything Aang can offer. Mm -hmm. Aang and Toph do try to help rebuild parts of the town that were destroyed, but their help is met with hostility and ultimately rejection. One of the angry townspeople plainly tells the two, Benders destroyed our homes. We don't want the help of Benders to repair it. Aang tries to assure them that he is different from the other Benders, but his words do not change their mind. What are you going to do? Force us to take your help? Of course not, Aang tells them. Then leave us alone. Oh. Yeah. This is heartbreaking for Aang. It is. He just wants to help. He just wants to be your friendly neighborhood avatar to solve everyone's problems. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here reading this comic thinking, why didn't this happen earlier in history? Why is there a rift now between benders and non-benders? And I really do think it's because of the fact that this industry, this progress is creating a divide between benders and non-benders. Before, there wasn't this kind of divide because everyone just lived harmoniously. Everyone mm -hmm. had their own roles in society and everything was fine. But now we're seeing the division being made by who can work when and how. Yeah. And I think we'll see this a little bit later, but I do think that some benders consider themselves superior to non-benders uh -huh. and that translating to the work industry as pay me more money because I can do yeah. this faster and then we'll learn that they can't necessarily do it faster anymore. So suddenly their own internal value of what they perceive themselves to be is also kind of taken away and shattered a bit, Yeah, which isn't good for anyone mentally, regardless of if you're a bender, non-bender, whatever, right? Uh-huh. It's a lot of like interesting psychological stuff that happens between in, in this issue that's probably going to end up playing out in Korra in terms of yep. perceived worth, perceived worth of others. And also, I don't know about you, but I'm a pretty big believer in you can only really come together when you have a common enemy. Mm -hmm. So I think now that Ozai is gone, the common enemy is gone unknowingly subconsciously they're kind of looking for that next <laughs> enemy yeah. that next uh, conflict and it's uh, between them yeah i think you're right this is the next us versus them yes and it's whether it's right or wrong i'm not talking about that right now i'm saying that it feels like that thing has shifted for sure yep so after he's told to go kick rocks essentially ang reluctantly accepts this and lao assures him that he is already helping by agreeing to attend the meeting in that Lao might have a solution to end all of this violence in the city. Hmm. Toph declines to attend the meeting, wanting to see if Satoru, everyone remembers him, our dear friend Satoru from the Rift. The guy that Toph was getting a little flirty with. Yeah, the inventor guy, her secret boyfriend, maybe. 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 <laughs> anyway, she wants to go see if he came up with any new inventions since their last visit, and Katara agrees to join her. Sokka surprisingly decides to attend the meeting with Aang, since he wants to know how the business council worked and who knows, maybe he'll suggest a better name. Mm -hmm. While traveling through the streets on their way to city hall for the meeting, Aang again notes how much Cranefish Town has grown in such a short time and how overwhelming that growth is. Lao explains that too many people have come to the city to find work. As a result, the factories are unable to employ everyone and some benders have resorted to using their skills to make money through less than honest means, let's say. Yeah. Lao tells Aang and Sokka that he has a plan to put an end to the conflict. They shortly arrive at the meeting room for the business council. 
And Sokka almost immediately notices that the benders and non-benders are sitting on separate sides of the room and points this out to Aang, who wonders why the council would be divided in such a way. Hmm, Aang, I don't know. Why? <laughs> As the meeting begins, Lao reveals his big plan. He hopes to ban bending in public. Yeah, that sounds good. Just take away the thing that is dividing the people in your city. That won't make them even more mad. It's just the worst idea. And it's like, you kind of forget, at least I did, how kind of an idiot Lau is. And he seems yeah. to kind of have it together and he's got a plan and you should have probably expected it to be an idiot plan. <laughs> you know what it is? It's someone who is not understanding the other side. Yes. You know, yes. he's a non-bender yeah. going... Oh, let's just take away bending. That'll solve the situation for everyone. Not putting himself in the other person's shoes and understanding the nuance. I mean, we see that in our politics mm. every day. We do. Someone making a law or a rule or something that affects another group of people that they don't belong to mm. and going, this is a great solution. And they go, I can't hate benders. My daughter is a bender. <laughs> yes, that too. <laughs> God. I hired benders to go find her. <laughs> wow. I'm so sorry, my friend. You're on the wrong side of history with that plan. Aang is understandably caught off guard by the proposal. He does the, um, what's that meme of the monkey puppet who side eyes? Yes. <laughs> That's what Aang does in this place. He's like, Ugh. And one of the bender council members claims that benders should be free to use their abilities however they want. Another jumps out of their seat and accuses Lau of having an anti-bender agenda. That sounds familiar. I can't be anti-bender. My daughter is a bender. I'm so, I'm so shocked. <laughs> One of the non-bender council members asks the benders how they would solve the problem. She tells the other members of the council that she is afraid to walk through her own neighborhood at night because of the bending menace. The meeting quickly dissolves into an argument between both sides. Now we know why the Bender Council members don't sit next to the non-Benders, Sokka whispers to Aang. Meanwhile, Toph and Katara arrive at a much larger Earthen Fire Industries factory, where they are greeted by Satoru. As they head inside, Katara points out a pair of people dressed like Lao's bodyguards, not the usual uniform for factory security. Satoru explains that additional guards had to be hired to deal with break-ins at the factory. When Katara asks what happened to the old guards, Satoru tells the two that it's complicated with a smile on his face. She's trying to brush it off. Satoru goes on to show them that the factory's new, far more advanced and efficient product line. But Katara soon notices that there are no more benders working in the factory. When Toph asks for a reason, again, Satoru tells them that the reason is complicated. When Toph demands a more detailed explanation, Satoru finally tells her that as a result of the upgrades... Machines and non-benders were able to do all of the work in the factory, and some benders were subsequently let go in order to save a couple bucks. Ah, that's familiar. Capitalism. <laughs> it's wonderful for 1% of the population. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the bender employees who were not let go resigned in protest as they thought they were being replaced by machines. Satoru assures Katara and Toph that this was not his intention when he invented the newer machines. He merely wanted to improve his technology and its productivity. This is like the road to hell paved with good intentions kind of thing. Right. Yeah. I can see him getting hyper focused. He's like, I could just make this better and better and better and not thinking about the ramifications of this. Yeah. I will say this for the writing. They did a good job of writing the dawn of capitalism yes. in a naive way. You know, for sure. Like. Nowadays, we are so used to how capitalism has destroyed so much of our culture and our society because it's making a buck at the expense of your workers, at yes. the expense of all of these things. And meanwhile, Satoru was basically doing this, not realizing, but being like, it's efficient. This is great. <laughs> Look at all the extra stuff we can do. <laughs> yeah. He goes on to say that benders throughout the city have lost their jobs since other factories installed similarly productive machines and that some benders now refuse to work for factories owned by non-benders. This also explains what happened to the guards that we saw in the rift. They were benders and they refused to continue working and protecting the non-bender owned factories. Yep. Toph tells Satoru that she loves the machines and that the other benders dislike of these inventions is kind of crazy in her mind. She then, this is the best part of it, she goes, these are great. I don't know, they're all crazy. 
by the way, if any of these metal bend, I'll end you. She didn't say it like that, but <laughs> that's basically yeah. how I read that. Yeah. That's my thing, Satoru. <laughs> and I immediately was like thinking about our real world machines and how they just metal bend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Toph, you're out of a job very soon. We return to Aang, who is about to address the business council. He tells them that he will not support a ban on bending because it would just punish honest benders. But he also cannot ignore what is happening in Cranefish Town. He comes to the conclusion that the city needs a real police force, something to serve its citizens and establish law and order. A woman from the bending side stands up and agrees with Aang. She introduces herself as Leeling and that she grew up in the area that Cranefish Town was built on. Leeling reveals that she has a security team of benders recruited from Cranefish Town's population who could be trained as police officers. Aang asks about the size of her security team, and Leeling admits that she doesn't have enough to police the whole city, but they could pass their training on to others. Lau asks that the non benders be included in the police force, and Leeling agrees, but only after the police force has been established and violence in the city is dealt with. She's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Later. That's not suspicious. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would be the dream to have non-benders in this police force, but only after they've been trained properly and only everything after, has been dealt with. Yes, only after the police force has been established with benders only. Then we'll get around to the non-benders. Meanwhile, Aang in the background, like, uh, this is weird. I can't tell this is weird. This is weird. <laughs> Despite this, Lau has doubts about the idea, but Aang doubles down and tells everyone that a police force is a logical way to protect the people of Cranefish Town. Li Ling thanks the Avatar for his contribution to the meeting, stating that Cranefish Town currently needs true leadership rather than unfair laws that punish honest people. She calls for a vote on Aang's proposal, and much to Aang's surprise, the entire council votes in favor of it. We believe in you, Avatar, Li Ling tells Aang with a twisted smile on her face. It's so obvious that she's the bad guy. It's so oh obvious. Oh my gosh. I was just like a little less foreshadow. Like you don't even have to foreshadow this. If they did not foreshadow this, and at the end when we get that like little splash page or that big one pager of her like being evil, by the way, spoilers, she's the bad guy. That would have been a bigger surprise. That would have been really cool, I think. Uh-huh. But instead yeah. she's like, might as well be twirling a mustache this whole time. Yeah. <laughs> yep. After the meeting, Sokka and Aang talk about the outcome of the meeting. And when Sokka realizes that they'll be staying for longer, he sends a messenger hawk to Suki, asking her to join them. I'm excited to see Suki in future issues now. Because they have an opening in the party slot. So yeah, <laughs> let's get Suki here. As they walk through the streets, Aang wishes that the people of Cranefish Town had been more respectful of the environment when they expanded, which he admits was probably a little naive. And I wrote, in big capital letters. Oh my God, no, Aang. He is mm -hmm. starting to get sour at the world. He's letting it change him. Yeah. And it's just, it's so sad to see. I know. And it's like, he makes that comparison later in the issue from when he woke up in the iceberg to now and seeing how much the world has progressed. We sometimes forget that he is over a hundred years old mm -hmm. and he's only been out of the iceberg for like, what, two years now? Yeah, something Ish. like that. Yeah. So really, like most of his life has been spent in the past and here he is in the present experiencing all of this massive change. It's like a time traveler, you know, you come to a different time period with your own modern or your time period sensibilities. And this must be so hard for him to come to terms with. Agreed. Again, I know I said this in the very first episode, but I am again reminded of the parallels between him and Steve Rogers, Captain America. Yes. Yes. That's a great example. That's a very common theme that's been repeated. I feel like since the 70s or the 80s with Captain America, where he's brought out of the uh -huh. ice and he's a hero for a bit. And then he sees the true face of the world and he doesn't like it. And he starts to question yeah. himself. And it's it's very existential and it's very interesting to see a character who is presented in whether it's lawful good or how do you perceive in DD &D metrics ang as a character oh gosh uh not lawful good he's not lawful like, good yeah. like captain america the next one over you think whatever he's neutral that good be. i think he's neutral good i think he's chaotic good you think so I th really he's lied to get his way oh that's true <laughs> He's, I think well, he's done so on more than one occasion. Everyone remembers the Great Divide lie, but I feel like he's done it since then as well. He has. He has. We've noticed 
and marked that every time we yes. come to it. Yes. Yeah. Ah, well, I say neutral good because he, he kind of plays both sides sometimes. That's true. To get the outcome that he's trying to get. That's true. I feel like I would have agreed with you if it wasn't for one of the director commentaries that I was watching. And they, oh, yeah. they pointed out, Bryke was talking about Aang and his trickster side. And I was like, I don't know if I would call him a trickster. Ah. And they started talking about it a little bit more. And now I can't unsee that. Oh, okay. <laughs> now like, he's forever just kind of, he's a very light trickster. Like he's not Loki by any stretch of the imagination, but he's yeah. still like, he lies a bit here. And he is very trickster E with his fighting styles and stuff like that. Right. It's always up. And I think for me, trickster is mostly non-conventional. Uh -huh. And that's a great way to describe Aang. But whether it be neutral good or chaotic good, I was just curious. I hadn't had yeah, a chance to talk to you about that's that. That's a fun question. Yeah. I almost want to know what everyone else would be. Yeah, let us know. Aang admits that he's, you know, the, the thought where he would come back to a lusher, greener environment was probably a little naive. And Sokka tells him that trying to stop progress is like trying to stop a lion turtle. You literally can't stop it because it's huge and will crush you. Oof. <laughs> yeah. As soon as the words leave Sokka's mouth, Katara runs up and tells them that Lao arranged a house for them to stay in. Sokka immediately rushes over, but Aang asks Katara if she'll join him for a ride on Appa. She, of course, accepts, and they land on a small island overlooking the city. Katara notes that Aang has his quote-unquote avatar look on his face, and Aang admits <laughs> that he is thinking of Lady Tianhai. Uh, Aang, you don't admit you're thinking about another woman when you're with your woman. Even when she's a spirit? <laughs> yeah. Hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of years old. Even when she's actually <laughs> dozens of cranefish in physical form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He recalls her belief that humanity could learn from its mistakes and create a civilization that could preserve and protect as it expanded. Katara asks if he thinks that he let Lady Tan hide down, but Aang replies that his return to Cranefish Town has reminded him of when he woke up from the iceberg and how much mm -hmm. the world had changed. Katara tells Aang that the two situations are definitely different and not comparable because he has friends now. That's like a weird writing. She's like, that's different. You have friends now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Thanks, Katara. She also notes that they are seeing more and more development in larger cities everywhere they go and wonders if this is just how the world is now and they just have to accept it. She doubts that Cranefish Town's current state was done on purpose and truly believes that the team can still fix things in the city. Aang says that something about the city just feels off, as if its growth is more akin to chaos rather than progress. Maybe there's still time to help the city grow in a way that protects and preserves, Aang says as he holds Katara's hand. This was kind of nice to me. I always love when we see scenes between Katara and Aang yeah. being a couple and not romantically. Yes. The fact that they see each other as equals and they're like, Katara's like, you ready to turn in? No, I want to go for a ride. Basically like a walk around the neighborhood. But in their case, it's Appa. So they're taking a ride. And then they just go talk about life and their current situation and kind of share their thoughts and opinions with each other. It's nice. It's showing that I've always heard that one of the best signs of a good relationship is the ability to communicate with each other mm -hmm. because you can have good conversations for your entire life regardless of what your situation is your physical health like being able to talk with your partner is is really healthy in a relationship and so we see that with them they just like to talk with each other and hang out and be with each other and they respect each other's opinions and i love seeing that yeah sometimes it seems like ang and katara's relationship is put on the back burner uh-huh yeah. When you're not, when they when they run off and the story isn't focused on them and we, we run off with Sokka and Toph, for example, it's like, oh, they're just doing couple things. But those couple things are like healthy relationship mm -hmm. couple things. <laughs> yeah. They're not just like making out in bushes or anything like that, which maybe they're doing, maybe <laughs> they're not, but they're having like supportive conversations with one another. Right. Which is really nice yeah. to see. Yeah, absolutely. So back in Cranefish Town. Two young women forcibly enter the hideout of a firebending gang and tell the members that they have a job opportunity. By the way, everyone, if you're wondering, this is the same firebending gang as the beginning of the issue. Yep, that we're fighting with the earthbenders. The two young women ask if they would be interested in being part of a movement seeking to benefit benders and their families worldwide. The leader of the gang rejects their offer, 
prompting one of the girls to reveal herself as an earthbender and takes out everyone in the gang except for the leader. Mm -hmm. Being a bit scared and doesn't want to get taken out, the leader agrees to do as they say. Yeah. Yeah, He's like, okay, whatever you want. Just leave me alone. I'll do it. I'll do it. Whatever you say. And the other girl is pleased by this response. There's something about their energy. Mm. I don't know if this is the right kind of illusion to make, but it's almost like influencer energy, if that makes (laughs) sense at all. Kind of. Do you know what I mean? Kind of. It's like they bust their way in and they're like striking a pose and being so self-confident, being like, hi, my name is so-and-so and and we have a job opportunity for you. You should sign up. Do you know what I mean? Don't forget to use code BENDING30 for 30% (laughs) off your order. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's the way that they're drawn to. It's yeah. like they're so completely carefree and mm. self-confident. And here's our business opportunity. You're going to join it. Use code whatever. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. Happening. This is happening whether you like it or not. Yeah. The next morning, Team Avatar heads over to the beach to rid it of debris and trash. As they work, Aang is approached by two easily impressed firebenders named Lian and Shen. Oh, they're cute. They're so cute. Sokka is just as happy as Aang to see someone in the city who can still be impressed by the airbending trick with the marbles. Mm -hmm. Though Sokka wonders if they would still be fans of his if they were non-benders. Aang awkwardly replies that he hopes they would be. And Sokka agrees, jokingly claiming that he only hangs out with Aang to impress strangers. (laughs) Or that time when he pretended to be the Avatar. Or yes. So he could either be the Avatar or let people know that he knows the Avatar. Exactly. Yep. By the way, if anyone's wondering, Toph was a part of this beach cleanup, and her idea of cleaning up the beach was metal bending the debris into statues of herself. Yes, I loved that. (laughs) The beach is just littered with metal Toph statues. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, with like nuts and bolts and in like wrenches sticking out of them. It's so funny. It's so good. That night, Toph is awoken from her sleep by a clanking sound coming from the Earthen Fire Industries factory. When she goes to investigate, she discovers that one of the machines has been deliberately jammed. The machine explodes seconds later, alerting Satoru and the rest of Team Avatar, who rushes to the explosion. Don't worry, everyone. Toph survives. She metal bends a sheet over her to kind of shield herself from the explosion and uses her seismic sense to figure out that there were two people running away, guessing that these are the saboteurs responsible for all this. Greg? Yes. Did you appreciate that seismic sense panel? I did. I very much did. Yes. Thank you. Very different from the last time we saw it when Mm -hmm. you complained. Yes. Oh, man. (laughs) Uh, I I blocked out the other one, to be honest. Yeah. (laughs) I've forgotten. The big red, like, jagged lines. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for reminding me, Acorn. You're welcome. Oh, gee. Anyways, Toph and Aang chase the saboteurs, and when one of them tries to sneak attack the two, we see that they are a member of the same firebending gang threatened by everyone's favorite influencers. (laughs) Aang leaves Toph to take care of this firebender, and he uses his glider to pursue the other. Aang manages to track down and trap the other saboteur, who is the gang leader, and traps him with his earthbending. Aang demands to know why he attacked the Earthen Fire Industries. Meanwhile, in the background a little bit, mm-hmm. the two influencers, I was called influencers, they were young women I in mind, but they're I love that forever they're sticking. influencers. The two influencers are hiding nearby and the earthbender collapses the cliff that the leader of the firebenders was trapped on. Aang swoops down in an attempt to save his life. While the attempt is happening, we learn that this was clearly meant to silence him before he could reveal the big evil plan that he has been led into now. But unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, Aang manages to save the man's life and the two fly off, which isn't exactly how our influencers wanted this plan to go. I love how they were surprised that the Avatar didn't do that. Lie yes. saved him from falling to his death. I don't know. It's so weird. Is he the last airbender? It's like he's the last airbender <laughs> or something. I mean, imagine that. Imagine that. Uh, the two young women, or our influencers, are revealed to be named Ru and Ye Ling, and they report the events of the sabotage to Li Ling, who happens to be the girl's mother. <gasps> I thought that twisted smile looked familiar. After seeing the two of them argue, Li Ling reminds them that what they're doing 
is for family. I feel like this was like the Dom from Fast and the Furious speech. <laughs> Stop arguing. Yeah. We're family. Yeah. We must be together on this. We must be united, she tells her daughters as they understand the words and sentiment. Plans are now in motion. Not even the Avatar will be able to stop them. <laughs> she doesn't laugh, but like... Such a classic bad guy speech. It really was. Li Ling says as she smiles menacingly at the imaginary camera in front of her. Yes. yes. The end. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everyone who is watching me on Twitch knows that I'm not super into this issue right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It feels weird. I hope it gets a little bit better in parts two and three. It's doing a lot of setup. It's doing a lot of world building for us very quickly, mm -hmm. which is jarring, but maybe that's the point in like a meta kind of way. Yeah. But regardless, that was issue one of Imbalance. So I got to know, I always need to know, who's your MVP for this issue? Because I have no idea. I know. It was one of those stories that didn't feel as dynamic as past stories have been, where Agreed. there's a lot of like big actions or big story points. It was just kind of like, yeah, you know, we're going through this adventure in Cranefish Town. So because of that, I think I might have to say Toph. Okay. For funsies. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. That's very fair. I guess technically, if we define the MVP role as someone who moved the plot along, this wouldn't be possible without them. There's a couple uh -huh. that pop out. I refuse to give it to Lau. Absolutely refuse. Yeah. Even though right. his idiotic idea is kind of what pushed everything moving forward. I think I'm going to have to give it to Aang for yeah. presenting Lilling the opportunity to kind of manipulate this task force that they're going to create, this police force. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to have to give it to Aang, runner-up Leeling, I think, because she's actually the evil mastermind moving the pieces around. Yeah, I know. And for that reason, I gave it to Toph because she was like the comedic relief. Yeah. She was like yeah. the best part of the comic from an enjoyment level, an entertainment level. That's fair. But that's a good reasoning too. Yeah. What is your moral of the issue? Oh, that's also tough. No, that's tough. That was your MVP. <laughs> <laughs> there is your pun, everyone. There it is. Oh, man. I feel like it has something to do with progress being really difficult to deal with. Mm, yeah. Progress is rough, but it's unstoppable. Like Sokka said. Progress is rough, buddy. It's rough, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's unstoppable. If you stand in front of it, you'll be crushed. Yeah. I'm in a very anti-capitalism mood right now. Okay, nice. Let's have it. So I feel like mine is just capitalism's not great in any universe. Oh, that's a great one. <laughs> it's just really I not accept great. that. <laughs> not, we're not in a good place right now. But yeah, that's it. That's everything. Remember, if you're caught up on all of the issues, you've done next week's reading, which is going to be what, Acorn? Imbalance Part 2. That's right. You can always join me over at twitch.tv slash boostergreg on Monday and Friday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I've been doing game votes lately over on my Discord, my little Discord that some people have found. And I thought for sure, as we're going into Halloween month, that we're mm -hmm. going to be playing a spooky game. And out of nowhere, Tinykin won, which is kind oh of like God. a Pikmin game. So <laughs> I guess we're not having a spooky Halloween season. We're going to play a cute, adorable little Pikmin type game. But like a, a scary filter on top of it. I do little intro videos. I think I'm going to make a scary intro video for it. There you go. I, think, nice. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But it's going to be great. If you're listening to this well after the fact, we'll still most likely be live. So give the uh, the channel a follow and you'll get a notification when we go live. You can come in, hop in, join us as so many people have done before. I'm going to rattle off five off the top of my head in no particular order. My brain is chaos. So I just remember things as they show up. So it'll <laughs> join myself and Tina Bina and Avatar the Podcast Mega Fan. Yes, someone made that screen name for Twitch, which was great. Incredible and Singa, and Lindsay Boo, and Dead Sniper. Thank you to those five who I remembered for no particular order or rationale. It just happened <laughs> to pop in my head. If I forgot about you, tune in. Yell at me. It'll be great. It'll be a good time. It'll be funny. If you don't like Twitch for whatever reason, you can also find me on Twitter, on YouTube, on TikTok, on the internet in general. At Booster Greg. Go to the Booster Greg side of the interwebs. Yes, it's great. There's puns and chaos and random sounds being played <laughs> at any given point. Very true. <laughs> and you can find me by searching for Acorn Bandit or Joyce on Studio. That's J-O-I-S-A-N-S dot -S com. 
or Joey San Studio on Etsy. However, if you're listening to this around the release time, both of those are on vacation right now as we do a rebranding, which I am very excited about, which has completely taken up my brain and my time. Can't wait to share it with you all. I'm doing more handcrafted items and they are super fun, but you will eventually be able to see the complete new look of Joey San's probably come 2023. I was going to say, if anyone wants to pay me to know what these plans are about, she told me about them, but then she told you what she told me. So I can't provide (laughs) any additional insight. Greg has like two more pieces of insight (laughs) to the plan. And I've already already forgotten them. (laughs) Yep. So, you know, if you want to pay Greg for some insights, you might be able to get like a penny's worth. Maybe. Who knows? I'll charge you a dollar for it (laughs) because capitalism. Uh Uh-huh. There you go. (laughs) All right. All right. Well, that's it for everyone. Everyone, thank you so, so much for hanging out with us and for leaving the five star written reviews. As always, if you want to hear your review be read on the show, not live because it's pre recorded, but if you want to hear it live on the show, you have to write it. Why? Because that, dear listeners, is how the written language works. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Also, I do want to take a quick moment to shout out all of our patrons. We super appreciate the backing and the support that you all have provided. It really, really does help in tough times. And I'm actually kind of glad that we went bi-weekly now because yes. times are oh, tough. Man. And that switch to a schedule has certainly helped, as has your support. So thank you. Thank you all so, so much. If anyone wants to contribute to the Patreon page, you absolutely can. You go to patreon.com slash avatar the podcast. It's all right there. We have some episodes of The Secret Podcast up on there. I was thinking about maybe doing some blogging on there about some thoughts that are rattling around in my brain a little bit. That's a great idea. I think I just want to do a Zhao appreciation post. I've been thinking about Zhao a lot lately. (laughs) Do it. Uh, The man, the myth, the sideburns. (laughs) There we go. Everyone, thank you so much. We'll see you next time on Avatar Avatar, the the Podcast. Podcast. Avatar, the podcast, is a proud part of the Geek Generation Network. Remember to check out all of our podcasts at thegeekgeneration.com. 